the skies, the golden nugget, flagship of the Alaska Airlines, that's north from Seattle. Among those aboard is a party of bow hunters, eager to set their skid up against the big game of our 49th state. The great land, as Russian discoverers called it, beautiful, vast, and wild, Alaska is one of the last true strongholds of nature in our world. From Fairbanks, the hunters must travel to the hunting grounds and relays by a bush plane. Bush pilot Dick McIntyre deftly lands his super cub on a freshet formed gravel bar. This is the grub stake area of the interior, about 100 miles from Fairbanks. Bow hunter Fred Bear is greeted by Bud Gray, one of a party of seven who have come in earlier ships the day or two before. En route to the campsite, frequent stops are made to observe the variety of wildlife. This is the land of the giant moose, the truculent grizzly, the beautiful white doll sheep, and the nomadic caribou. He had moose antlers bleached by the elements are examined with interest. Upon topping a rise, Fred rouses a large grizzly from his favorite blueberry patch. The tundra at this time of year is carpeted with a much purple fruit. At camp, Fred is regaled with accounts of a pair of huge caribou already down by the arrows of Jack Albright and Keith Summers. Next morning, Bud Gray joins Fred in a practice section. The archer's Kodiak bows have a drawing weight of 65 pounds. Powered with special parallel fiberglass over a tough maple car, they're capable of driving a sharp arrow through the largest of game. Blunt-tipped arrows are used for this kind of practice. Having limbered up, the bow hunter's next job is to become a part of his surroundings. A bit of greenery in the hat and a suit of camouflage clothing take care of all that it takes. For this, the old Indian trick of applying charcoal serves to eliminate the telltale glare. The resulting ensemble is not exactly fit down in styling, but it's certainly appropriate for the job at hand. With the limited range of his weapon, the bowman must blend with nature if he hopes to be consistently successful. Preparations completed, Fred sets forth in search of whatever adventure the Red Gods may send his way. It's unusual at this time of year to travel any distance without seeing caribou. Here, antlers were cleaned as velvet. Well. Up ahead, a bull, alerted by a vagrant breeze, nervously paces the ridge line. The hunter slowly travels on, pausing every little while to scan the terrain with his eight power binoculars. A movement down on the flats draws his attention to a fine, big caribou. Having dined sumptuously on reindeer moss, he lies down to rest. This presents an excellent opportunity for a stop. After maneuvering around to get the wind in his face, the bowman proceeds to cautiously work up on the unsuspecting bull. As he straightens up to shoot, the caribou sees him. Lunging to its feet, it narrowly avoids the swift arrow and wastes no time in going elsewhere. Oh, well, the miss is in order once in a while. The hunter continues on short way before game is once more back. Fred slowly works up, using clumps of willow hooks to screen him. The will has seen him move and is suspicious. The caribou are notoriously short-sighted. This old boy can't quite make him out. Having run out of cover, the bowman chances a shot. The shaft arcs through the air and passes completely through the caribou. He runs off without realizing what has happened. The hunter now carefully follows the animal, staying just close enough to keep it in view. The caribou travels only a few hundred yards before collapsing while trying to ford a stream. This doesn't present much of a problem for the bowman, for his boots are handy in the small pack for just such an emergency. and tendon arm proved to be a full 
return with notes for the remainder of the week can be made later. At camp, the bow hunters compare notes on their experiences. Glenn St. Charles is also down the fine caribou. Out of the tundra, an example of the effectiveness of good camouflage is demonstrated as Bud Gray waits for a caribou to feed within range. His patience earns him a shot with a close miss of his own. But now decides to work up the mountain. On the way, he encounters a handsome blonde grizzly. Tricky air currents warn the bear, and he decides things may be more peaceful over the hill. A little later, Glenn, who was watching from a ridge near camp, sees Bud make a clever stalk culminating in a beautiful brown sheep. The ram was shot in its stead from a distance of four yards. The beautiful full curl horns, which the hunter proudly carries back to camp, later proved to be a new world record for bull hunters. After seeing Bud's ram, Fred is determined to try for a similar trophy. He first prepares by carefully resharpening his razor head hunting points and fits them with new auxiliary blades. As all experienced bow hunters know, sharp broadheads are an absolute necessity for big game. Today, the trail leads upward to the peak, into the domain of the snow white sheep. The hunter passes ewes and lambs, but only mature rams with horns of three-quarter curl or more are classed as legal game. The dawn is the only wild white sheep known, and is the smallest species found on this continent. A large male will weigh about 200 pounds. The doll's white color makes them easy to locate. But in order to make a successful stalk, the hunter must see the sheep before it sees him. When nearly to the top, Fred locates a large ram bedded down on a grassy ledge. While these sheep possess the keenest eyesight of any large game animal, they have one failing which may tip the scales in favor of the hunter. They do not ordinarily look for danger from above. As the bowman nears the crest, the marmot sees him and shrills a warning whistle. The ram is alerted but can't quite figure out whether there is danger or not. The hunter starts to shoot, but the sheep is facing him, offering only a narrow target. A moment later, the ram turns to flee, but too late. The deadly razor head catches him in mid-stride. Dying on his feet, the sheep plunges off the ledge to a shale slope and slides down for several hundred yards before coming to a stop. Fred wastes no time in getting down to it. Not as large as Bud's ram, nevertheless a beautiful specimen showing 11 annual growth rings on his wide-spreading horns. After the usual chore of cleaning, skinning, and removing the horns, the hunter starts down the mountain, heading for the shimmering ribbon of water flowing past the camp several thousand feet below. Crossing the stream late in the afternoon is always difficult, as the rise in temperature during the day brings the water level up considerably. Between the current and the slippery boulders, it's hard to keep up right. The slip would prove more than embarrassing. The glacial water is extremely cold. Once across, it's but a short jaunt to camp two. Glen St. Charles is on hand to greet his tired but happy companion with a traditional handshake and congratulations. 
There's almost a unanimous opinion among experienced outdoorsmen that wild sheep is the finest of all game meats. A section of ribs broiled over the coals certainly tends to support this theory. Such gustatorial delight is catching that a small neighbor, the parka squirrel, joins in the feast. The following morning finds the bow hunters breaking camp. Keith Clemens doubles as a pack horse in carrying out a huge load of caribou meat. The riders have four caribou and two doll sheep cooking, certainly a fine showing for their efforts. The bush pilot will have to make several trips to ferry the men and meat back to Fairbanks. All too soon, the bow hunters will be boarding the Alaska Airlines flagship for the flight outside. Behind them, they leave the vast reaches of primitive grandeur. May future generations yet find it thus, unspoiled and serene. It is early September. The serene stillness of the Canadian bush is momentarily interrupted by the drone of a plane gliding down from the sky. After a smooth landing on the waters of Cold Fish Lake, the pilot taxis into the shore and awaiting camp. We are in the wilderness of northwestern British Columbia. Outfitter Tommy Walker and his Indian guide greet the arriving hunters. The bush breeds friendly men, and the new arrivals are not strangers here for long. Their chosen weapons are the bow and arrow, and a joint practice session with the guides is an excellent means of getting acquainted and, of course, limbering up for the hunting ahead. The bow hunters get down to some serious practice, using an old canned goods box filled with earth as a target backstop, and shooting arrows with blunt points in place of the usual hunting heads. Their shooting techniques vary slightly. Each archer has his own way of drawing, anchoring, and releasing, the style that feels best to him. Aiming is done instinctively, that is, they concentrate on the spot to be hit, much as does a tennis player or a bowler. Fred Bear appears on the scene and sends a few shafts flying at the target. His glass-powered hunting bow has a drawing weight of 65 pounds. Well, word is passed around that the expedition is soon to get underway. While the Wranglers are engaged in loading the string of pack horses, Nick Knickerbocker does some loading of his own. Freshly sharpened broadheads are fitted in a handy bow quiver having a lightweight aluminum cowl to protect the archer from contact with the razor sharp blade. Now this quiver style was designed to hold extra arrows in position for rapid successive shots if necessary. Soon all is in readiness and the party rides out of the corral on a high trail to waiting adventure. September in the Rockies is a magic season with its clear vistas and panorama of changing colors. It's wonderful just to be alive and a part of the scene riding along at ease with the world, far from the work and worry of the job at home. Sounds and smells of the open seem suddenly more acute. Perceptory senses quicken as the hunters progress ever deeper into the wilderness. Now, travel without horses in this country would be most difficult. The faithful horse carries heavy loads of food and camp gear, fords rivers with ease, and most important, saves the men the energy of walking to be expended later in the hunt itself. Over hill and dale, meadow and stream, the guides unerringly lead the way until the site to be used for the hunting camp is finally reached. The process of getting everything in working order is underway rapidly and efficiently. Each member of the party has his own job to do. Tents, stoves, and other camp gear are quickly erected and assembled. Bowhunter Bud Gray, easing into a camp chair, wonders why inexperienced horsemen are called tender feet. One of the guides gathers some dry spruce, and after splitting it into kindling, deftly fashions some of the pieces into a supply of fire sticks. These will come in handy on cold mornings when a warm blaze is wanted in a hurry, or in case a sudden storm dampens the firewood. And in 
Andy and Wrangler cheerfully cross-cut some logs for the evening fire. Basking in the sun at the entrance of his rocky den, a hoary marmot, or whistler, is an interested observer of this bristling activity. The two of his neighboring relatives seem to be having a family squabble. <laughs> I'll teach you to roll your eyes at that silver-haired hussy. All I do is slave away minding the children while you're out gallivanting around. You either stay home and tend to business, or, or I'll chew patches out of your worthless hide. Well, it will soon be forgotten. Fred takes time out to re-examine his hunting arrows and proceeds to put as fine an edge on the broadheads as he possibly can, working toward the point, stroking evenly with a flat mill fire. It takes very little effort to maintain a fine cutting surface. Then come the auxiliary or bleeder blade. Insertion of these easily replaceable units doubles the head's effectiveness and ensures efficient cutting and deep penetration. In the morning, Nick and a guide set out to hunt the high country. Here again, horses are useful for covering the terrain. Such hunting parties as theirs can penetrate only the fringes of this vastness, and perhaps the trails they follow today have previously felt the tread of no other feet than those of its varied animal inhabitants, large and small. Frequent stops are made for observation with binoculars. This is an absolute necessity in this type of hunting. Finally, the glasses find what they seek. Rocky Mountain goats, their snowy coats gleaming against the background of gray rock. Too many in this group for a successful stock, but there are bound to be others nearby. Nick rides around the shoulder of the mountain to bring additional country into view. Another look through his binoculars shows what he's been looking for, an old bachelor Billy off by himself. Conditions here are ideal for an approach in that the hunter is above the animal and the wind is blowing up the mountain slope. However, the goat is slowly traveling. Nick has to hurry to get into position. Finally, his chance comes. A long shot. He sends a shaft flying. Was it a hit? Well, he isn't sure, but the arrow looked good all the way. A hurried trip down to the point where the goat was last seen reveals blood signs. And just a bit further down is Mr. Chin Whiskers himself. The guide who has come up after the shot congratulates him on a clean kill. In examining the prize, they note the short legs and compact, well-muscled body, built for climbing rather than feet. The snowy coat of heavy fleece and the sharp jet black horns will make a beautiful trophy. Barred Owl views the triumphant tableau from his windswept perch. Well, back at camp, a change of pace is in order. Where the nearby river flows into a lake, the cold glacial waters are teeming with beautiful and extremely edible life. A few false casts to get out line, and then Nick's fly alights on the water, only to be engulfed by a silvery torpedo. The trout expends his energy in a series of mad dashes to and fro, pausing now and then to shake his head like a, a terrier shaking a rat. But his streamlined power is no match for the tough nylon tether and springy glass rod. He's coming easier now. Got him, Lick? Yeah, where'd he go? Now they're tricky, these trout. Ah, success at last. Ed Hankel, meanwhile, hasn't let any moth grow on his line. Every few casts of his fly result in the rise of another fat, scrappy rainbow as he sucks in the lure and attempts to take off. In this country of crystal waters, far from civilization, the rainbow really belongs. Trimly muscled, armored in a coat of silver mail, and as cold and clean as the water from which he comes, he's a fitting opponent for the fly fisher. The poor uneducated backwoods trout are, however, no match for the know-how of the city slickers. Ah, well, a fitting finale will take place at the cook's fire tonight. Next day, the hunters and their guides are in the saddle again. This time, they traverse the lower altitudes over rolling miles of tundra. It isn't long before game is sighted in the form of caribou, those carefree wanderers of the Northland. 
At this time of year, the various bands are slowly gathering from their summer feeding grounds into large herds in preparation for the mass migration which starts with the early snows of winter. As there seem to be caribou scattered in every direction, the hunters separate. Fred Bear and his guide ride on through a gathering mist of rain. Uncomfortable, but excellent for approaching game. It isn't long before they come in view of a fine bull, temporarily all feeding by himself. The terrain looks good for a stalk, so after marking out a possible route of approach, Fred climbs down to prepare for a try at it. Shedding his bulky rain gear, he unfastens his ready bow, grabs a spare arrow from the saddle quiver, and takes off. The rolling ground and scattered patches of scrub willows aid in hiding his advance from the bull, whose curious attention is drawn to the guide sitting atop his horse in the distance. A large lichen-clad boulder, deposited on the tundra by some long-ago glacier, further conceals the bowman's approach until he's well within the range of his weapon. Fred picks the spot on the animal he wants to hit, concentrates, then releases. A deadly razor head flies through and does its job quickly. The caribou goes on but a short distance before the succumbs. Soon, the men come running up to the fallen trophy. A fine white maned bull with a wide spreading rack of newly polished antlers just out of the velvet. He's rolling fat, and the guide tells Fred, just to look at him makes me hungry. After the necessary skinning and quartering, the men take off for camp. The moisture-laden clouds close in on the travelers, and the temperature takes a sudden dip. So that by the time they get back to camp, the rain has turned to wet snow. The hunters are glad to have a fire waiting to warm them while they compare notes on the day's activities. Bud Gray bagged two fine mountain goats on this trip, but unfortunately, in both cases, similar weather wasn't suitable for pictures on the high mountain slopes. The next afternoon finds the party back at Cold Fish Lake. The plane is in again with supplies and, best of all, mail from home. After being out in the wild for a week or two, it's nice to hear once more from the outside world to receive the assurance that all is well at home. Sitting in a fall sunshine, with a wilderness at their backs, and the one link with the outside bobbing gently at its moorings before them, is a time of great peace. A unique refreshment of the spirit known only to those who have answered and shared the call of the faraway places. On a clear morning, the expedition gets underway, headed for a base hunting camp set up in advance by the outfitter and his crew. Spreading to the northward, nature sprawls for more than 2,000 miles in a broad panorama of rugged mountains, expansive forests, and vast stretches of tundra. Before the hunters have spent an hour on the trail, they begin to see game, a procession of mountain caribou. A first impression is one of amazement at so many racks of antlers in one group until it's remembered that antlers are worn by both sexes of caribou, those of the females being somewhat small. After a short pause, the pack train is once more on its way, for camp must be reached before nightfall. The horses are well trained and gentle, and because of fine weather, they make good time. Finally, the drifting set of campfire smoke reaches them. A rest and grazing are just ahead. The campsite has been set up in both a practical and picturesque location, close to wood and water with wild grasses and pea vine in abundance for the pack animals, and with a towering granite peak as a backdrop. Many lesser inhabitants are nearby. A willow ptarmigan contentedly preens his mottled plumage. When winter comes, his coat will change to one of completely white. Another hardy resident is the varying hare. He too will turn all white in winter. The ubiquitous red fox found throughout the continent lives up to his reputation as a keen mouser by dining on a tiny rodent. 
stud from his home in the top left. Bud Gray loosens up muscles stiffened by hours in the saddle with a bit of practice. His Kodiak bow, like those of his companions, is powered with tough modern fiberglass pulling about 65 pounds and capable of speeding his feathered shaft almost faster than the eye can follow. Having limbered up, Bud proceeds to check over his favorite hunting arrow, reworking the edges of the main blade with a mill file and inserting fresh auxiliary blades in the razor head point. Well, the following morning, all hands are out searching for game. In these wilderness areas, no methods of hunting other than still hunting or stalking are practical. The terrain is of great scope. There's much game, but it's scattered over hundreds of thousands of acres of cover. The hunters must seek until they locate game, and then stalk to within effective range of their weapon, which in the case of the bowman is usually no more than 50 or 60 yards. The men decide to separate. Outfitter Tommy Walker and Nick Knickerbocker ride down toward the valley in hopes of a chance encounter. Although they are not aware of it, a fine bull moose is nervously watching their progress. The moose, largest member of the deer family, ranges throughout these regions north to the limit of tree growth in the Arctic. In growing to such size, they appear to have sacrificed beauty for an ungainly though powerful bill. Now, Nick picks up a movement in the spruces. It takes a sharp eye to distinguish moose in such cover, for the color of their coat closely matches that of the trees. The flash of polished antlers is often the only means of detection. And once Nick is sure of what he's seen, he saw his horse and on the run, keeping cover between himself and his quarry until he closes to within arrow flight. The bowman loses a swift shaft. His instinctive aim soon proves to have been true, as the delighted hunter and his equally happy guide approach the fallen bull. Not in the record class, perhaps, but still a very fine whack, to say nothing of the good many pounds of succulent tenderloin, chops, steaks, and roasts in the making. These animals average over 1,000 pounds in weight. A shot and a trophy to be proud of, and the hunter clearly shows his feelings in the matter. the outfitter accomplishes the task of skinning and quartering the moose, Nick brings up help and additional transportation. Finally, the meat is all stored aboard, stopped by that big rack. It takes two pack horses to carry the load. So the weather has presently taken a turn for the worse, and the prospect of moose steak sizzling over a hot fruit fire draws the men back to camp without further delay. A bit of tallow placed on the ground soon draws that ever-present camp follower of the north, the Canadian Jay, for a whiskey jack. His gluttonous appetite is compensated for by his friendly character. Another excellent source of table fare is to be found near camp in a box of willow ptarmigan. Having had little or no contact with man, these birds are not too wary. Ed Henkel is the first bowman to get into action and makes a very close mix. The hum of another bowstring, the swish of an arrow, followed by feathers floating on the breeze, signify the solid hit. And running up, Nick retrieves the speckled ptarmigan. Feather leggings extending to the toes are characteristic of these birds. Soon, Ted finds the range, and his blunt-tipped arrow accounts for another serving. The covey is now scattered in the willows, but the conspicuous birds are easier to follow. And so it goes, hits and misses, until enough birds have been secured for a camp feast. ventures forth on a game scouting expedition. Alternately traveling and glassing the countryside, he crosses a broad valley and eventually winds up on a veritable rock pile of a mountain. Suddenly he sees game, and his eight-hour binoculars soon confirm the fact that a fine mountain sheep is making his way across a slope in the shadow of the peak. The ram's dark color, except for his strikingly white rump hat, Jet black tail identifies him as a stone sheep, the last type of wild sheep to be discovered in North America and the least known to a majority of sportsmen. Marking the ram's course of travel, Brett piles off his mouth, determined to head him off if possible. Well, it's rough going up the rocky slopes, but Brett's long legs and the mountain. 
knowledge of a fine trophy somewhere ahead of him makes life worth the climb. He must be careful, however, not to dislodge any rock which could betray his presence, and can only hope that a vagrant mountain breeze will not drift this scent in the wrong direction. In the shelter of an outcropping, he pauses to check. Lucky is with him. The sheep is still there, within range now, and although alert, has not detected the hunter. Quickly heading a razor head to arrow to his bowstring, then takes careful aim and releases. A white shaft streaks through sunlight and shadow, meeting its intended mark. The Indian guide now hurries up, and together they traverse the slope another 200 yards to where lies the monarch of the beast. Aloof from all other game animals living in a high world of his own, the stone sheep is undoubtedly one of North America's finest animals. The ram which they now examine is a perfect specimen. Annual growth rings on his massive curved horns proclaim him to be 13 and a half years old, 41 inches around the curl. Too late, a once in a lifetime trophy for a bowman. Fred's ram was later determined to be the second largest stone sheep to have been bagged in that area with any weapon and presently holds the Boone and Crockett world record for bow hunters. Back in camp, the guide prepares a head and cape for the taxidermist, and deftly skins out the feet from which will be made bow racks to decorate the hunter's den. The golden haze of autumn has deepened now. Soon the first heavy snow will go down, making pack train travel impossible. It is time to go. As efficiently as it was erected, the camp is taken down and packed. The rich poles, log tables, benches, and hitching racks are left where they stand for possible use again next year. The large tents must be rolled and folded with care in order to be properly fitted on the pack string. Any sloppily done bundle would not stay in place long, and the working loose would unbalance the entire load. All of the equipment is the most efficient for the job, even to a telescoping stovepipe, which takes up a minimum of packing space. Loading the horses properly is a real chore, and not as simple as it looks. These men from long experience make the job seem easy, but a load such as this piled on a horse by you or me would quickly end up scattered about the countryside. A rule of the trail is to get moving as soon as possible after packing is completed. The last task, to hoist some of the heavier gear, such as stoves, boxes, utensils, and horseshoeing tools up to a high platform or cache between trees where bears or other animals cannot reach them. Batten down with a heavy tarp as protection from the elements, they'll be waiting for the hunters next year. Finally, all is in readiness, and somewhat reluctantly, the bow hunters bid a silent farewell to their wilderness home. The ride out is a quiet one. Each member of the party engrossed in his own reverie. A feeling of the sweet scope of this great land, the still majesty of height and distance, is abetted by clear skies, crystal waters, and the splendor of autumn foliage. All too soon, they are back at Coldfish Lake and the waiting plane. The pack train is unloaded. Personal gear and clothes are separated from camp equipment and made compact for storing the boat. Soon, all is loaded, and the men board the ring of Pegasus. After last goodbyes are exchanged with their companions and guides of the trail, they fasten seatbelts, take a last deep breath of the spruce-scented air, and settle back for the long flight out. The ship rides out to deep water. The pilot gives full throttle, after a short run, eases back on the stick, and the hunters are homeward bound.